enough. Uh, mothers are, you, you can't describe how important mothers are. Um, and it's a day, hopefully, that mothers feel appreciated, feel recognized, feel valued. And, and you would think that on Mother's Day it would be just a day of, of bliss, of being appreciated and recognized. Um, but oftentimes Mother's Day is, is with mixed emotions, right? Because sometimes we have regret, we have disappointment. We do feel valued, we do feel respected, but there's a whole mixture of emotions. And it's our hope this morning that as we study God's Word together, we will worship the Lord. It is His day, even over Mother's Day. Uh, but we will also encourage our, our ladies to feel special, uh, whether you are a mother or not, uh, whether you are married or not, whether you are single. Um, we hope, I hope, that you will be encouraged as we study our word today. Um, right now, I'm going to give a, a few descriptions of a woman from one chapter in the Bible, and I'm about to read these descriptions to you of this woman, and I would like you to try to figure out what chapter from the Bible I'm reading. Uh, I'm just going to give little summary statements about this, this woman. This woman is described as being intelligent, prompt, diligent, thorough, generous, instructive, discerning, humble, unselfish, God-fearing, confident, and hopeful for the future. Now, I'm going to guess that most of you are thinking Proverbs 31, but that's not where we're going today. And you might be thinking, there's actually someone in the Bible that matches with these characteristics. There is. But I'm going to confess with you, this person is not perfect. She is a sinner. In fact, in our text, I think she does something that I disagree with. Um, but there are traits about this person in our text, this woman from our passage in the Old Testament, that I think are worthy of our observation. And I hope that they remind us of Christ. Because there's actions this woman takes in our passage today that remind me a lot of Jesus. It's an imperfect example, but I hope that it reminds us of what Jesus did for us. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. It's my hope this morning that we do encourage our ladies, whether you are a mother or not, again, whether you are single or married, that you would be encouraged to be a woman of wisdom, a woman who seeks the Lord, who seeks His will, and who makes actions that are in alignment with His will. And I also hope that we better appreciate what Christ did for us. To whom those who by faith received Him, we who were destined for certain death, and received His peace. So let's get into 1 Samuel chapter 25. The text writes, then, date, the, excuse me, then Samuel died, and all Israel gathered together and mourned for him, and buried him at his house in Ramah, and David arose and went down in the wilderness of Paran. So we're at this text in 1 Samuel that David is on the run from Saul. Saul is continually trying to find David. Uh, Samuel dies. This is the end of an era. Uh, this was a godly man that had passed. David is on the run, and now he's moving further south of Judah, away from Saul. And it says, There was a man of Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about that while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now this man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. And he was a Calebite. So we kind of get the setting of the stage. We have David is in the wilderness uh, fleeing from Saul um, into 1 Samuel. And there's a very wealthy man named Nabal. And his name is kind of a play on words that's going to come out through our text. His name means fool. Uh, it, it has to do with foolish. And he's described uh, not just being as foolish, but he's actually evil in his dealings. And his wife's name was Abigail, and she was intelligent. Uh, it, it could also be translated good of insight, sensible, discerning, wise. She was wise. So we have this contrast between an evil, harsh man and a wise woman. And it says, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, and greet him in my name. 
And David is about to present this request to Nabal. And throughout scripture, it's kind of ironic, there's three instances that I was looking at this week. The shearing of sheep, it, it involved people from the tribe of Judah, and every time it was a festive time. It was a time of celebration where there would be plenty of food to go around. And it would be opportunities for people to be generous and to share, and there would be plenty. So what David is about to do, and he's going to ask for some food for his men. All right, David's on the run from Saul. And it's interesting, it says that in, in verse 5, David says, greet him in my name. Literally, he says, give him the shalom in my name. Give him peace in my name. Now, remember that word peace. Give him peace in my name. And thus you shall say to him in verse 6, have a long life. And then he says, peace three more times. Peace be to you, peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. So remember that. Give him peace in my name, peace to you, peace in your house, peace to everything about you. All right? Now I have heard that you have shears. Now your shepherds, verse 7, have been with us, and we have not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. He's, he's saying we were watching over your guys. We were helping them. We didn't take anything. We didn't hurt them. We were only positive for your shepherds. Ask your young men, verify with them, and they will tell you, therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes. May we find favor in your eyes. For we have come on a festive day. Remember, the shearing of the sheep, it's a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servants and to your son, David. Now think about the language David is using. He's explaining what had happened. He's presenting requests. He's saying, you can even verify what I just said. I'm calling myself your son. He's putting himself in a position of inferiority, asking, and he says, whatever you think is appropriate, we'll take it. He's not saying, this is what I did for you. Now you owe me, buddy. He's saying, this is what I did for you. Would you please give us what you think is right? So, verse 9, when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in David's name, and then they waited. And it doesn't tell us how long they waited, but they're probably waiting for his response, and while he's waiting to give a response, he's probably verifying with his servants what had happened. And, and we know in our text that the servants did verify what David had said. So Nabal is probably hearing the truth that David had done him good and not evil. And then we see how Nabal answers in verse 10. Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who's David? Who's David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread, my water, my meat that I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men whose origin I don't know? He's saying, who's David? He said, nobody. He said, who's the son of Jesse? Shall I take my stuff to give to this guy who's running away from his master? You know, the irony of all of this is that he knows a lot about David. <laughs> okay? It says that Nabal is a Calebite. He's from the tribe of Judah. David's from the tribe of Judah. If anything else, he's a distant relative. Okay? But in the very chapter right before this in 1 Samuel 24, King Saul, the king of Israel, had even said, David, you're going to be the next king. Okay? If the king of your country already proclaims publicly who the next king is, I think people would know that. Let alone that David was the one who took Saul's armies out and in, brought them in and out. Saul was, excuse me, David was the one who killed Goliath, right? Uh, David was the one whom they sang about. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So he's acting like, who's David? Who's David? Later on in the text, we know that, that this man, Nabal's wife, knew that God had promised David would be the next king. So he says, who's David? And he gives a very disrespectful answer. A very disrespectful answer. So David's young men retraced their way and went back, and they came and they told him according to all these words. And David said to his men, each of you gird on his sword. So each man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword, and about 400 men went with him behind him, while 200 stayed with the baggage. Basically what happened is, David says, saddle up. We're going to go kill him. Now, the text in Scripture, in 1 Samuel, calls David a man after God's own heart. Or it says, a man after God's own heart, and, and we figure out through the context that's referring to David. And if David is a man after, after God's own heart, is it okay for a man after God's own heart to want to kill people because they got disrespected? 
Absolutely not. Okay? David was totally overreacting. Yes, Nabal was returning him evil for David's good, but that was not an excuse for David to say, get your swords, we're going to go take them out. He says later on, we're going to kill Nabal and every man that's in his household. So David's got this basically army of 400 guys that's going up to go get Nabal. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. He railed them. He mocked them. He ridiculed them. Yet the men were very good to us. We were not insulted. We didn't miss anything as long as we went about with them. While well, they were in the fields, and they were a wall to us by day and by night. He's saying not only did they not do anything bad to us, but they're actually very helpful for us. They were a protector for us. All the time that we were with them tending the sheep, now therefore know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. Literally, the text says he is a son of Belial. Belial, he's a man of wickedness, and nobody can tell him anything. Okay, so remember that phrase. Then Abigail hurried. She acted promptly. She acted decidedly, decisively. And she took 200 loaves of bread and two jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. So she gets all of this food and, and we're going to find out what is she going to do with it. She's going to present it to David. She's, she's becoming very generous. She's acting quickly. She's decisive. And what is she going to do? It says, she said to her, her young men, verse 19, go on before me. Behold, I'm coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And it came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain, that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her. So she met them. So she's on her way, going as fast as she can to bring these provisions for David, which he'd asked for, and her husband had said, no, we're not giving you anything. I'm not going to give you my stuff for your people who I don't even know where y'all come from. All right? So she's hurrying, she's getting there quickly, and she's going head on into an army of 400 guys who are coming to destroy all the men of her house. And it says in verse 21, David said, Surely in vain I have guarded this man that he has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. David is saying, I wasted my time doing good to this guy who didn't appreciate what I did for him. So by tomorrow, I'm going to kill them all. Okay, again, this is not good. Okay, David is a godly man, but he's way overreacting. All right, so David is on a mission to go take out all the men of Nabal's house. And then it says in verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she hurried. She's hurrying, she's acting, she's taking initiative. What is she doing? She dismounts from her donkey, she gets off quickly. She fell on her face or she threw herself down on the ground before David, bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet. And, and what one word could you use to summarize everything she just did? Respect. She's showing him respect. She's getting down and she's doing the exact opposite thing that her husband did. Her husband was very disrespectful and she's showing incredible respect. She's hurrying. She's being prompt. She's wanting to rectify the situation and she's showing him respect. And then what does she say? She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the blame. Now, this is amazing because she wasn't even there when the servants we're relaying this information to Nabal. She wasn't even there. And she says, it's my fault. It's my fault. She's taking ownership for something that she didn't even do wrong. In fact, she's taking ownership for someone else's wrong. And she says, put the blame on me and please let your maidservant speak to you. Again, respect. She's calling herself a maidservant of David. This is a really wealthy woman whom her husband had just totally scorned, and she's saying, may I, may I even speak to you? And then she says, listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my, let my Lord pay attention 
to this worthless man, this man of Belial, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. And I would say, I do not think it's appropriate for a wife to call her husband a worthless man. Okay, this is where I think the example is an imperfect example. Okay, you could say she was telling the truth, right? And she could, you could even argue this is a, a, a play on words. His name is Nabal and Nabala follows him. He's a fool and foolishness follows him. And you could make an argument, that's true. And it is true from the text. And I would say, although I think for the majority of the passage, she does a great job of stepping in. And she's a great picture of Christ. She's still an imperfect person. And I, I would not endorse everything she does. But she's telling the truth. And she says, his name is Nabal and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men whom you sent. I didn't see your servants. Put the blame on me. Please forgive me. Pay no attention to what my husband just did. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood. Who does she invoke the name of? Yahweh, capital L-O-R-D. She says, now therefore, my Lord, she's talking to David, Adonai, you're my kind of master, as the Lord Yahweh lives and as your soul lives since the Lord Yahweh has restrained you from shedding blood. So she's seeing something in a bigger picture than just David and Nabal and Abigail and all these servants. She's saying, the Lord, the God of Israel, is stopping you from shedding blood, from avenging yourself by your own hand. Now then, let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Again, using this word as a, a fool. She's saying, don't take it into your own hands. Let your situation be taken care of by the Lord. Amen. She's encouraging him to trust in the Lord. That's wisdom, is it not? She's encouraging him to have faith. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who have accompanied my Lord. So she's saying, I'm giving you a gift. And I want you to receive it. We'll get to that here later on. I'm giving you a gift and I want you to receive the gift. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant. Again. She said earlier, put the blame on me. Now she's saying, please forgive me. For the Lord, Yahweh, will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. How can she say this unless she walked with God and trusted him? And she is calling on the name of the Lord and saying, may he give you an enduring house because my Lord, David, is fighting the battles of the Lord, Yahweh. She's aware, like I think everybody in the land, that David had been fighting the battles of the Lord. And even though the king of Israel was unjustly pursuing David, David never fought him back. Because David respected the Lord's anointed. And David still was trusting in God when he was on the run for years. And she is saying, may the Lord give you an enduring house because you are fighting the battles of the Lord and evil shall not be found in you all your days. She's wanting him to walk with God. She's trying to prevent him from making a grave mistake. She's wanting him to be a godly man after his own heart. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound up in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. Who's she talking to? She's talking to David. If you could say one name in all of human history that you would associate with a sling and a stone, it's that guy. I don't think that's a coincidence that she's trying to get him to think big picture. God can take care of you. He can sling your enemies out like a stone. He can protect you. Of all the people who would know what a sling and a stone meant, it would have been David. This woman is wise. This woman is discerning. 
And it will come about that the Lord shall do for my Lord according to all that he has spoken concerning you. How did she know that God had spoken promises over David? Because I think the people of Israel knew that. Because I think several times in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel we see instances of people know that David is supposed to be the Lord's anointed. But he's waiting until God takes out Saul, the Lord's anointed, in his own time. So she knows David is going to be the next king. He shall appoint you as ruler over Israel. She's, again, getting David out of this, it's me against Nabal, it's me against Nabal. She's saying, hey, the Lord has made promises to you. Wait on the Lord. Don't take it into your own hands. The Lord is going to take care of you. Don't sin. Trust him. Wait. She says, wait, verse 31, then that this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself. She's saying, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this because you're taking vengeance into your own hands. And one day you're going to look back and say, I shouldn't have done that. One day you're going to look back with regret. And I think consequences. And we don't need to spend too much time. What if David wouldn't kill Nabal? We don't know what would have happened. But I know in scripture that when the king, even King Saul, made mistakes and totally disobeyed God, there are consequences for sin. And she's saying, you don't want to do this. In her wisdom, she feared God. She saw it with a divine perspective. And she is trying to get David to do the same thing. Fear God. Trust him. Don't take this into your own hands. Because if you do take it in your own hands, you're going to look back and you're going to regret what you did. And if, if you and I, every time we're faced with a situation and we actually took time to pause and say, if I make this decision that I know is a sin, I'm going to regret it. I don't think we would do the sin that we're about to do. If we thought with the perspective of, I want to honor the Lord, I don't want to look back on this with regret. And, and, and by the grace of God, God sent Abigail in this story to stop David from making a terrible decision. And she says, you don't want to do this. This will cause grief, a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause. Basically, you, you don't have the right to kill somebody because they insulted you. And by my Lord having avenged himself, when the Lord shall deal well with my Lord, then remember your servant, your maidservant. She's saying, when God takes care of you, Remember me. Who does that kind of remind you of? I think of the thief on the cross, right? Uh, remember me later on, even though this is a, a time. And, and she's saying, look forward to the time when God provides for you everything he promised. Remember me. So I think she's looking forward. She sees God in the big picture. She's trying to stop him from sinning. She's encouraging him to be a godly man. And then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. David finally slowed down, calmed his anger, and saw you're a godsend. Literally. God sent you to stop me from making a terrible decision. He says, blessed be the Lord who sent you to meet me. And blessed be your descendants and blessed be you, excuse me, blessed be your discernment, your wisdom, your understanding. And blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Bless the Lord. Blessed be your wisdom. Blessed are you. I'm so thankful that God stopped me from doing the sin that I was about to do. Shouldn't that be what we think too? When God stops us, he shows grace to prevent us from doing something that we know is wrong. And may we have the wisdom to say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to fear him. I'm going to keep his commandments. I'm going to obey him. And when we do that, may we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for stopping me from doing this. Nevertheless, verse 34 as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal until morning light as much as one male. He said, if you didn't come here, all the men in your household and your husband 
would be dead by tomorrow morning. So David received from her hand. He received from her hand. He received the gift. He received the gift that she wanted him to receive. And he actually received it. He received the gift, what she had brought to him and said, go up to your house in peace. Now, isn't that funny? That the very first thing David sent his servants to Nabal, he says, give him the peace in my name. Peace be to you. Peace be to your house. Peace be to everything that you have. And then in the middle of the story, David wants to bring him anything but peace. He wants to bring in the sword. And by the grace of God, Abigail stopped David. And the last thing he says is, go in peace. Isn't that cool? Let's keep going. He says, go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. Then Abigail came to Nabal. Behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But it came about in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, that his wife told him these things. And his heart died within him, so that he became as a stone. He was frozen. People would say it was like a stroke, or maybe a heart attack. We don't know, but what we do know in verse 38 says, About ten days later it happened that the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. It wasn't that 10 days later, Nabal just so happened to die. It says the Lord struck him and he died. And who was going to kill him 10 days prior? David. And Abigail said, you don't want to do that. Don't take it into your own hands. Trust God and believe that he'll take care of you. And guess what? Promise fulfilled. God did take care of David. He protected David from sin. And then it says... He struck Nabal and he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. Man, David's doing a lot of praising God. When God acts, David notices and he says, Bless the Lord. Do we do that? Do we even notice when God acts? See, we should be blessing God all the time. When we see things that the world says, Oh, that's nice, that's fortunate, that's a coincidence, we should say, Praise the Lord. Look at this provision. Praise the Lord. Look at that provision. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Right? David says, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal. He has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife. David remembered who this woman was. She's a woman who saved him from grave sin. She was a wise woman. A beautiful woman who came in and she said, leave it in God's hands. Leave it in God's hands. Trust the Lord. Okay? So, David says, I want her to be my wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David has sent us to take you as his wife. And she arose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, behold, your maidservant is a maid to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Translation, yes. <laughs> Humility, right? She gets down and she says, let me wash your feet. Who does that kind of remind us of? Who else in the Bible got down and washed people's feet? She says, let me wash the feet of your servant. So Abigail quickly arose. Many times in the text it says she quickly, she hurried. She takes action. Okay, she takes action, but her action is not reckless. Her action is, she can take action quickly because I think she is walking with the Lord. And she's involving him in, in the decision. Sometimes we do need to slow down, right, when we make decisions. And we do need to seek the Lord in all that we do. But if you're consciously walking with him and presenting your request to him day in and day out, it doesn't mean that you have to take four years to make a decision. Because sometimes you may know on the spot, this is honoring of the Lord. This is his will. So sometimes we need to be careful not to say, I need to think about this forever because I don't want to make a foolish decision. If you're seeking the Lord, he will give you wisdom. And, and sometimes you can make a decision quickly. So she quickly arose. She rode on a donkey with five maidens who attended her. That takes humility, right? She, she's a wealthy woman, so wealthy that she's got five gals who help take care of her. 
And she calls herself the servant of my Lord's servants. Let me wash your feet. Again, humility showing up. She takes her five maidens. They go. She follows the messenger of David. She became his wife. David had also taken a Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. Now Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who is from Galim. Okay, a lot, of, a lot of stuff happening. Abigail and another gal become David's wives after his first wife, Michael, is given to another man. And I said, my hope that after our study this morning is that we do two things. That we encourage our women to be godly women who seek the Lord, who fear the Lord, who look for his will, and who make decisions in light of his will. And that we better appreciate what Christ has done for us. Because although she's an imperfect example, I think Abigail is actually a really good example of Christ in the scriptures, the things that she did. But how can we encourage our women to be godly women? Proverbs says in Proverbs 9:10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How do you become a wise woman? Fearing God. How do you become a wise person, man or woman? Fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Knowledge of God, understanding who God is. Where do we get that? Where do we understand who God is? It's from his word. It's from spending time in his word. If you spend time with God in his word, you will fear him. You will appreciate him. You will love him. You will delight in him. And you will become wise. And Abigail, I think it says in the very beginning, it says she was a woman of insight. She was a woman of, of wisdom. And we see throughout the text the way that she speaks she feared God and she saw the big picture and she wanted David to see the big picture too and say, trust him. And then it says that, that, that she stopped him. That even though David had intended peace and then he intended murder and then he left with peace, she was a peacemaker because of what she said. She used her words to bring about life. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. She's a wise woman who uses her words to calm the situation. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of words. She was using her words to bring peace and to bring life. Think about we've been going in Ephesians with Pastor John here. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only a word such as is good for edification for building up, right? So that it may give grace to those who are here. Or in Ephesians 5, it talked about don't have coarse talk. Don't have, don't have things that are, that are filthy coming out of your mouth. But then it says give thanks. So in Ephesians 4, it says use your words to give grace to others. And then in Ephesians 5, it says use your words to give thanks to God. So if you're wondering, what do I talk about with someone and I don't want to gossip and I don't want to sin and I don't want to do something? Does it give grace to somebody else? Does it give thanks to the Lord? Does it give grace? Does it give thanks? What did Abigail do? She was wise. She brought peace. And she saved lives. We will be blessed if our mothers, if our wives, if our single women, if the women in this church seek to be wise women who fear the Lord, who keep his commandments, Seek to be women who bring peace. Seek to be women who give life, give grace, give thanks to the Lord. And then I said earlier that I wanted us to see what Jesus has done for us. And I think about David was on his way with 400 men with him to bring certain death to Nabal. And you know the Bible says apart from God's intervention, apart from God sending Jesus into our story, like David said, God sent Abigail to stop this. If God hadn't sent Jesus, says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all in condemnation under Adam. Romans 5 talks about we are linked with Adam, and because of his one transgression, we are all under his condemnation. And the wages of sin is death. So just like Nabal was a man doomed to certain death, so is all of humanity apart from Christ. And she came in to stop. And she said, put the blame on me. Remember at the very beginning? She says, put the blame on me. 
And just like she put the blame of somebody else on herself, and she was putting herself on the line as a mediator between Nabal and David, do you know what Jesus did? It says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Jesus is the only mediator between man and God. And how did he bring about peace? She was a peacemaker. He brought about peace through his own death on the cross. So Colossians 1 says, Jesus, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Ephesians 2 says, he himself is our peace. Isaiah 9 says, he's the prince of peace. Paul says in Romans 5, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. See, Abigail came on the scene. She said, put the blame on me. And she brought peace. And Jesus came on the scene. And it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. He didn't just take our blame. He took everything. Amen. And he made peace through the blood of his cross. Think about that. She says, forgive me. Forgive me. Please forgive me. When Jesus was dying on the cross and people were mocking him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. She says, let me wash your feet. Jesus washed his feet. She's an imperfect example of Christ, but Christ is what the whole Bible's all about. Who is Jesus and what did he do? And remember I said that she wanted to give him a gift and she hoped that he received it? You know, that's the message of the Bible. That God gave a gift in the sending of his son and he hopes that all men would receive it and come to the knowledge of the truth. For God so loved the world that he gave, that's a gift, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God gave the gift of Christ and he hopes that we receive it. And just like Abigail gave a gift to David and she hoped he would receive it and he did receive it and he received life when he did that. God sent Jesus to be our Savior, a ransom payment for us, hoping that we would receive him. He doesn't force us. But as many as received him, to, the, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. Abigail was a woman of wisdom. John just read in the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 1, Christ became wisdom for us. She sought to bring peace to David and Nabal, right? And Jesus is our peace. He brought peace. She sought to save lives. Jesus came to give his life and to become a ransom for the many. Have you received the gift of salvation in Christ? Have you received Jesus? And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the satisfactory payment for our sins. God was satisfied. The wrath of God was satisfied when Jesus died on the cross. And you can trust in him by faith, saying, I believe that Jesus is my savior. I receive the gift. I'm a sinner and I do not deserve forgiveness. I do not deserve peace with God. I do not deserve eternal life. But I receive that gift by faith. I trust in Jesus, my Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Abigail this morning in 1 Samuel 25 that she stepped up and demonstrated wisdom and brought peace and brought life and I ask that you would be active in the lives of our women here today. That they would be God fears, that they would seek you, that they would seek your will from your declared word. I ask that they would make decisions that are in alignment and in agreement with the Bible. I ask that you would bless them, that they would be appreciated today, whether they're a mother or not, that they would feel valued and appreciated by you and by others, Lord. For those who are believers, May we all walk with you. May we all fear you and keep your commandments. May we all 
receive your wisdom by faith. May we involve you in every decision, Lord. May we not seek to walk on our own strength. May we trust in you and acknowledge you in all of our ways. Lord, and if there's one today who has never received your gift and they want to trust in Jesus and they want to do so right now, I ask that, that you would pray with me in your heart and say, God, I am a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. But I receive Jesus as my Savior. And I believe that when he died on the cross, he made the full, full and complete payment for my sins. And he rose from the grave. And he ascended into heaven. And he is my Savior. And one day he's coming back. And I look forward to his return. Amen. Lord God, I trust in you. I am not saved by my own works, but I am saved solely by your grace. And I receive your gracious gift of Christ through faith. It is not of me so that I can't boast, but I will boast in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.